data. Unfortunately, our president was not able to join us for academic commitment. Because, as you know, September is a very hectic month. Okay, I think that we can start with this webinar discussing an important report and discussing around an important report that Union for Mediterranean uh, asked us um, about the internationalization of education institutions in the Mediterranean area. Uh, this report is the first time that there is a report in such dimension, regional dimension, and I'm very uh, pleased to introduce Madame Itaf Benabdava from the Union for the Mediterranean, and a special thanks from my side for, to the Union for Mediterranean for the role that they play in the region, of, of course, but more in particular for the idea to uh, realize this report, because it's a very important report. We will discuss about how we did this report that is not just, uh, not, is not just done by UNIMED, but by our community, which is more important to, to mention. And I think that this idea to have this report will be will guide our work, as I said, in the coming months and most probably in the coming years. I think that, and I hope that is a starting point that in the future years we will be able jointly to update this report and to, to see eventually uh, where we are and the improvement that altogether we are going to, to our region. Madame Benabdala, the floor is yours. Merci, merci, merci à vous. Euh, je voudrais saluer chaleureusement tous les participants à cette table ronde sur l'UPM et son rapport sur l'internationalisation euh, de l'enseignement euh, supérieur en Méditerranée, fruit d'une étude conduite par Unimed et euh, rendue euh, publique, comme vous le savez bien, euh, le mois de juin dernier. Euh, nous tenons à remercier, je dis nous tenons, c'est à mon nom et au nom euh, de toute l'équipe Higher Education, mais également au nom de notre secrétaire général euh, de l'Union pour la Méditerranée, à remercier le réseau Unimed, en particulier euh, professeur euh, Marcello Scalisi et toute l'équipe pour avoir mené en pleine pandémie euh, une étude qui couvre les dix pays euh, du sud et de l'est de la Méditerranée. Nous espérons que les résultats et les recommandations du rapport final stimuleront la poursuite de discussions conjointes sur euh, des initiatives et des projets concrets pour notre euh, région. Pour nous, l'enseignement euh, supérieur, c'est une priorité. La coopération régionale dans le domaine de l'enseignement supérieur et la recherche joue pour nous un rôle essentiel pour améliorer les perspectives d'avenir des jeunes euh, dans la région méditerranéenne. Euh, dans de nombreuses régions du monde, des décennies de programmes d'échange ont créé un sentiment d'appartenance à la communauté internationale euh, et on a pu const euh, constater en particulier que les étudiants ayant passé euh, des périodes d'études à l'étranger trouvent plus facilement un emploi par rapport aux autres étudiants. Ces résultats positifs appellent à une plus grande internationalisation de nos systèmes d'enseignement supérieur dans les deux rives de la Méditerranée. La notion d'internationalisation euh, va au-delà de la mobilité académique. Elle implique l'intégration d'une dimension interculturelle et mondiale dans les méthodes d'enseignement et également dans la gouvernance des institutions et ce qui ressort de l'étude menée par UNIMED. Nous devons aussi euh, avoir à l'esprit que l'internationalisation n'est pas en, un objectif en soi. C'est un processus qui vise à améliorer la qualité de l'éducation et de la recherche. Et ça, c'est parmi les choses qu'on a appris euh, à la suite de nos échanges avec Unimed euh, pour préparer également cette étude. Pour nous, l'Union pour la Méditerranée, elle promeut un dialogue régional sur l'internationalisation de l'enseignement supérieur dans le but de construire une vision commune sur l'avenir de nos universités. Dans le cadre de ce dialogue, le besoin de consolider euh, les données sur l'internationalisation de l'enseignement supérieur de notre région a été ressenti. L'étude présente une vue d'ensemble de la situation régionale actuelle 
en termes de coopération dans le domaine de l'enseignement supérieur. Elle fait une cartographie des principales caractéristiques spécifiques de la région également. Et je crois la partie, pour moi, qui est encore la plus importante, ce sont les, les recommandations qui ont émergé de l'étude, tant au niveau national qu'au niveau euh, régional. Elles ont été euh, formulées en tenant compte des meilleures pratiques et des initiatives les plus euh, pertinentes pour, qui peuvent être reproduites et mises à l'échelle dans la région. Ces recommandations s'adressent aux organisations internationales, aux gouvernements, euh, aux établissements d'enseignement supérieur et à la société civile, démontrant que seul un effort conjoint peut garantir le renforcement de cette euh, dimension internationale de l'éducation. Espérons que euh, ces recommandations stimuleront de nouvelles discussions conjointes et qu'elles généreront euh, des solutions opérationnelles aux obstacles identifiés dans l'analyse euh, de la situation actuelle, la situation en matière d'internationalisation de l'enseignement supérieur. L'étude Enfin, notre lecture de l'étude, parce que je crois qu'on aura des lectures de l'étude, mais de notre part, l'étude affirme en particulier l'importance du soutien financier et des outils du programme Erasmus+. Les projets internationaux de mobilité des crédits et de renforcement des capacités ont été une réussite et méritent d'être renforcés. Grâce à ces initiatives, un vaste réseau d'établissements d'enseignement supérieur méditerranéen jette les bases d'un espace euro-méditerranéen de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche. Un espace euro-méditerranéen de l'enseignement supérieur et de la recherche. Parce que je crois qu'il y a un cheminement vers un espace euro-méditerranéen en matière de recherche, euh, et ce avec euh, la plateforme qu'on a dans le domaine de recherche et innovation, mais un espace méditerranéen en matière d'enseignement supérieur, on n'est pas encore arrivé à aboutir à cet espace euroméditerranéen. On vise, et l'Union pour la Méditerranée est parmi les outils, c'est parmi les outils qui peuvent euh, arriver à établir cet espace euroméditerranéen d'enseignement euh, supérieur. Malgré la pandémie, le PM s'efforce de renforcer l'intégration régionale. Nous sommes conscients que la crise que nous traversons a aggravé la disparité, a aggravé, et, et, mais également a mis aussi l'accent sur cette disparité. Certains pays étaient prêts à faire face à ce euh, défi inattendu, d'autres non. Dans cette nouvelle situation, il était crucial pour nous à l'UPM de continuer à soutenir l'amélioration de la qualité de l'enseignement supérieur, ainsi que l'employabilité des diplômés et des chercheurs. Et comme l'a exprimé le secrétaire général de l'Union pour la Méditerranée à maintes reprises, il est temps qu'une nouvelle réunion ministérielle sur l'enseignement supérieur et la recherche ait lieu. Euh, je crois que je, nous sommes en train de se répéter. Hein. Euh, le professeur Scalise a entendu plusieurs fois que je, je dis la même chose pour l'importance d'avoir une ministérielle enseignement supérieur, mais je crois qu'on est dans l'obligation de répéter ça en attendant qu'on parvienne à, à, à réaliser notre objectif d'avoir cette ministérielle. Et je répéterai toujours la même chose, vu que la dernière ministérielle s'est tenue il y a près de 15 ans, en 2007 au Caire. Le monde a changé depuis et le monde post-Covid sera aussi différent. Et le monde, monde Covid également est différent. Et, et je ne crois pas, c'est à, à vous que je vais, je vais, je vais m'étaler là-dessus. Vous êtes plus conscient que euh, n'importe qui de, euh, du changement qu'on est en train euh, de vivre. Euh, également, euh, enfin, euh, je suis également heureuse. C'est vrai qu'on on, on est en train de travailler en matière d'enseignement supérieur, mais euh, on travaille aussi en matière de recherche et innovation. Euh, nous sommes heureux d'annoncer qu'une réunion ministérielle sur la recherche et innovation est prévue pour le mois de juin prochain, en 2022. Il y a eu beaucoup de travail également pour euh, arriver à une ministérielle recherche et innovation, mais euh, on, a, on a après, euh, le résultat est là et la réunion, on est dans la phase de préparation maintenant euh, de cette réunion euh, ministérielle. 
La coopération en matière de recherche et d'innovation s'est considérablement développée en Méditerranée, surtout après l'approbation de la déclaration euro-méditerranéenne de la Valette en 2017 et l'approbation par la plateforme Recherche et Innovation en juillet dernier de nouveaux agendas sur le changement climatique, santé et énergie renouvelable. Ces programmes offriront la voie à une coopération plus efficace dans la région dans les années à venir. 2022, une étape importante, c'est, ça sera également la conférence mondiale de l'UNESCO sur l'enseignement supérieur qui aura lieu ici à Barcelone du 18 au 20 mai prochain. À l'UPM, nous soutiendrons cette conférence. Nous, a, nous créerons un espace autour de la conférence pour un véritable dialogue méditerranéen. Parce on va saisir cette occasion avec cette conférence mondiale pour parler également de la, de la euh, Méditerranée, pour avoir un dialogue méditerranéen sur la manière de traduire sur le plan régional les défis mondiaux, tels que la reconnaissance des qualifications, la qualité de l'enseignement euh, supérieur, parce que je crois que c'est un thème très important, euh, c'est la qualité de l'enseignement euh, supérieur, surtout pendant euh, cette situation de, de pandémie et après pandémie. Euh, il y aura un événement parallèle euh, lors duquel euh, nous comptons également discuter les recommandations euh, du rapport qui vient d'être publié, le rapport euh, élaboré euh, grâce au travail conjoint avec, euh, avec euh, Unimed. Et je crois, lors de la conférence, avec un public différent, et euh, que ce soit, on veillera à avoir également une participation euh, au niveau des gouvernements, parce que la, la participation des universités est très importante, mais je crois que c'est bien d'avoir une participation des gouvernements, des représentants des gouvernements et des représentants du monde universitaire pour présenter euh, l'étude, les recommandations euh, de, de l'étude et pour euh, également discuter euh, quant à la euh, nouvelle euh, ministérielle sur l'enseignement supérieur, euh, chose qui est euh, un sujet euh, qui nous tient à cœur, je crois, que ce soit côté UPM et également côté euh, Unimed. Je ne vais pas m'attarder encore plus, mais je tiens à vous souhaiter à tous une rencontre productive et je remercie encore Unimed, toute l'équipe Unimed, professeur Scalisi, euh, et je vous passe la parole. Merci encore. Merci, Madame Benabdana. Merci pour votre intervention. Thank you very much for your intervention. And you already said everything also related to my uh, introductory speech, and I will be very brief on this. And first of all, let me react on some uh, issue that you mentioned. Uh, to know that in June there will be a ministerial meeting on uh, research and innovation is extremely important. Yesterday, we had the presentation from the European Commission, G Research, Madame Cristina Russo and uh, Fadida Buganemi, and they clearly said to us about the free roadmap that we are working on, exactly climate change and uh, renewable energy and health that we find application in a way in the next uh, work work plan uh, but i suggest you know as unimed our role is to propose to push in a way uh, to to underline something and then obviously the the, the political institution the, the answer in the way that they can uh, but i think that there is in mediterranean in particular looking at the political situation of Indian countries I have to say both the European Mediterranean countries, but also the Southern Mediterranean countries, to try to have a dedicated space to the role of the social science and humanities in the Mediterranean. Because otherwise, we risk that we stay in a particular area, very technical, extremely important, of course, because no one can say that health is not a priority in a moment like this, or renewable energy and so on. But at the same time, we have a problem with uh, about the dialogue in the Euro-Mediterranean societies. And I think to invest a little more in social science and humanity, also in research, could be extremely interesting and important from my side. Uh, you already mentioned also the ministerial conference. As you know, we're following 
the, the appeal of the Secretary General during the, the launch of the, the study, we decided to launch a sort of appeal, a public appeal to our members, and not only to our members, partners, and for instance, also Erasmus Student Network uh, gave uh, their support uh, to this idea to launch a ministerial conference, a Euro Mediterranean ministerial conference on higher education. I don't know if, if we are in time to have it in 2022, but in any case, our, again, our role is to ask and in a way also to help, if possible, to debate which university we are looking for in Southern Mediterranean countries to, to answer to the challenges that the important challenges that we have in front of us. In any case, you know that you can surely count on us for our role of in front of consultation of, of our members, but also to provide contents if in case. We will be more than happy to support you for the event, the side event in May during the UNESCO conference. I'm sure to interpret also the uh, mandate of our members and not only of our governments, but for sure we will uh, support you in this in this in this part. Let me say in two minutes to something related to the report to introduce the session of today. During the session, we will have uh, a more detailed presentation from my colleagues uh, about the report. But in particular, we asked uh, another important international institution to give us their feedback on the importance of this study and what they think about in particular and looking in particular at the, 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 the part of the study, study dedicated to the mobility issues. This is the reason why this very particular for an organization like UNIMED to invite a student organization to listen their voices. And we are very happy to have with us uh, the Erasmus Student Network, which is a, an important partner of UNIMED. We are extremely, very, very happy about this collaboration. And they push us too much. I think they, they are very, very, very active. And I think there is a very nice opportunity uh, to cooperate all together. Then we asked four important leaders of uh, universities in Southern Mediterranean countries to talk about, to, to explain us what they think about the, the recommendations and the national overview that we did for uh, our Southern Mediterranean countries. Obviously, we can't invite 10 representatives, and this time we invite four different representatives done in, in the launch of this, for instance, and we will have with us uh, the president of the University of Tripoli that now see that join us, Professor Khaled Kun. Uh, we will have also our friend and colleague, Carriera Sass, vice president of the University of Nablus, uh, University of Najah in Nablus, in Palestine. Uh, we will have also with us from Egypt, from one university, Mayada Belal, that cooperate also with us for the study. And then we move to Morocco with Professor Selim Bono. She's also another friend of mine. We met some months, some years ago in Cairo. Very nice meeting in Cairo. Uh, with this perspective, with this presentation and contribution, we will have a very large overview about the importance of this study and what you think about this study, what you think is important to use about this study. I would like just to underline a couple of issues on this study. First of all, the study, as Dan uh, Benabedal clearly said, show us how important is the support of the European Commission for internationalization of universities? The importance of the Erasmus program and also the previous program is, is clear, uh, not only for the mobility, but for the capacity building, but generally speaking, is the only regional dimension where we, could, we can work all together. The Erasmus program, generally speaking, is important in the European side, but also the Mediterranean dimension show us uh, how important it is in terms of mobility of students, professors, researchers, and also this idea to working together to try to transfer capacity, 
this is the original vision of the program from the north to the south. At the end, at the end of the day, looking at our unimed experiences is a vice versa process. We learn each other. And this, uh, unfortunately, the pandemic is creating some problem to all this international cooperation dimension. But I hope that next year, hopefully, we will be able to start again to, to organize meetings and, and uh, end activity uh, in, in the region. The other element very important for, 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 for the re coming from the report are uh, already mentioned the national recommendations and the regional recommendations, and also the roadmap that we identified for, to answer these recommendations. Um, I, I would like just to clarify, this, this part of the study is not done by UNIMED in our headquarters in Rome, uh, thinking well, how is important to cooperate in the region or in Tunisia or in Libya and so on. Uh, everything has been done in close cooperation with our colleagues, our partners, our universities, members of UNIMED, not members of UNIMED, it's a very large sample of universities that cooperated with us, several focal points and several interviews and several focus groups that we organized to try to go in a very important detail for every country and obviously for the regional dimension. Obviously, is the first report of this dimension. There is a sure space for improvement but I think that is an important, a very rich and important study. And this will guide our cooperation, our cooperation with our members, first of all, but the cooperation of the university itself. As uh, Madame Benabdala said, uh, this study uh, show us, in particular the recommendation, show us that there, is, there are responsibility and uh, things to be done for all the actors. And only working together, government, networks like UNIMED and others, universities, uh, academic organizations, and obviously experts in the region and so on, not university association and so on, uh, only working together, we will be able to answer to the important challenges of, of the region. And let me say other two things about two important elements that I consider hope for our future activity. First of all, the importance of the mobility. In this situation, we are affected by uh, the lack of mobility. We are working virtually, also in this occasion. We also had the opportunity to work through Erasmus Virtual Exchange an important program launched by European Commission that will be uh, relaunched for the coming years. Uh, but for the importance of, uh, of this region, we have to come back to the physical mobility. And I hope that the European Commission will be able to invest more and more in this. We need more mobility of students, staff, professors. We need to show that is important, that is possible to study everywhere, to improve our capacity everywhere, and to create this, or at least to contribute to create this Mediterranean generation. But I hope in particular that working jointly with Union for Mediterranean and other players, with single, every single government, we will be able also to uh, create a space for the South-South mobility. We need, uh, more integration for, for the southern Mediterranean countries. And we have to start first from the mobility of students, which is a key element for the region. More mobility of students will live in, in the region among the countries. More economic integration will be led in the future, as we did and as we have in Europe. And the other element that I think that would guide our work is the importance of university autonomy academic freedom, and how to improve the governance of universities in the region. I hope that the recommendations that we wrote in this sense will give us the opportunity working together to prepare new projects, ideas, new uh, suggestions for the government, new support for all of the actors involved 
because we need a stronger university in the region. We need leaders of universities cap capable to play a political role, not to become politicians, of course, but to play a political role. I was in a conference in Slovenia a couple of weeks ago, also with our colleagues of Union for Mediterranean, and you know better than me that time by time we have academics that become politicians or politicians that at the end of their career, they would like to become academics. It's a very interesting uh, situation, but I think that every part in this situation has to play their own role. And our role to is to propose, your role of academics is to provide content, idea, vision, uh, because you know where we are trying to go and you know how to answer to the challenges that we have in front of us. And this is uh, something that, uh, this is at the end, the, the most important results of this, to try to have an overview to every single country, but at the same time to try to have a regional dimension, a regional review to try to answer to our common priorities and common problem in a very large and long-term dimension and to skip the critical points that we have day by day in front of us. I think that I'm perfect on time. I now play the role of moderator. I say that I'm on time. I invite now our friends and colleagues from uh, Erasmus Student Network, Juan Gonzalez, Juan Rayon Gonzalez, the president of Erasmus Student Network, joined with Yasin Khalil, which is liaison officer of RTSN, to make their own, their own intervention. You have uh, 15 minutes. No, sorry. You have 10 minutes. Sorry for 10 that. Minutes. 10, 15, but you know, in any we'll, case, we'll try to be as my colleagues to be shorter if in case, but please. Yeah, yeah, we will go straight to the point. We both like to talk, but we'll go straight to the point. Thank you so much, Marcelo, grazie mille. And thank you everybody for the invitation. It's, it's glad to be here. We're gonna share the keynote speech. We're gonna start with, uh, with my part of the presentation talking about the recommendations and connecting them with some of our particular ideas about how to improve internationalization in the Mediterranean. We have a small presentation, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen now. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, perfect, perfect. Yes. Fantastic, thank you so much. So first of all, a bit about ESN. The Erasmus Student Network is the biggest international student organization in Europe with a big presence around the continent. We support in total more than 350,000 international students and also young people in general from Portugal to Russia. But since we believe this is not enough, our next plan is to start expanding around the world and the very first priority is the Mediterranean. Besides the expansion, what we want to do is to provide our expertise and experience after 30 years improving internationalization in Europe to help students, to help institutions around the Mediterranean to improve in the field of internationalization. So this is our biggest goal, to use everything we have learned after 30 years of students helping students to create a more internationalized Mediterranean area. And connecting to this, we really welcome this report it's a fantastic report. We're so happy of having the chance to contribute to it. And we also believe that this addresses many of the needs that after 30 years of research about the needs of students, can we know many things that can help, that can be useful to improve the policies and the implementation measures that we can use to improve internationalism in the Mediterranean. So I'm going to comment about some of them. The very first one. There is a very concrete mention about internationalization strategies in the report. What we would like to add to this is that when we talk about internationalization, the report mentions very clearly that we cannot focus only on mobility. We totally agree. We believe that when we talk about internationalization, we need to consider the different tools, the different elements, people to people contact, common research, and always look for the links between them. This being said, as well, also, as Marcello was saying, the most important element of an international strategy should always be learning mobility, quality learning mobility, so we can bring people together. But 
we need to think about outcomes based mobility. Whenever we send and receive students, the most important part is the learning process. And for that, we should connect mobility with other tools like virtual exchanges, internationalization of the curriculum, and also from our experience, international networks of students, but also of researchers, also of staff, and different ways to connect all the, not only the student body, but the whole university community with peers from around the Mediterranean and around the world. And we should not stop there. We should also try to use these internationalization measures to connect with local communities at large. When we write our strategy, it should be clearly included how we're going to involve local NGOs, municipalities, and other relevant actors in our communities so they can also benefit from these exchanges. Then, second one, the report makes a very clear reference to the role that friendships can play, and we totally endorse this. It would be a fantastic idea to start including more and more Erasmus friendships in the Key Action 107 scheme that allows mobility flows between the Mediterranean. Uh, and in general, we support the idea of making this format more flexible, combining studies and transit. So a student who goes abroad for a certain period of time can combine a number of hours, for instance, working in a company, getting more acquaintance with the different dynamics, with new working methods, with different colleagues, and also participating in classes and participating in different lectures. We have our own platform, erasmusintern.org, which we have developed throughout the years, and we would be very happy to start supporting more and more this kind of trainship, this kind of mobilities, if they are gradually expanded to the Mediterranean. But in general, trainships are a great opportunity to address these labor market needs in both shores of the Mediterranean. Then there has been a lot of discussion about virtual learning, virtual mobility, virtual exchange. We like to talk about virtual learning more than virtual exchange. We normally do not talk about virtual mobility. What we believe in ESN, and also building on what's written in the report, is that the use of virtual and blended formats brings a great opportunity to introduce participants into internationalization. So it's never the end goal. It's a way to start creating connections that can last and can lead to outcomes. So we see it as complementary to mobility, and we encourage all the institutions to play with different formats that combine mobilities and virtual learning. We know from the Commission that short-term mobilities, also with the Mediterranean, will be introduced for next year. At least this is the feedback that we have got. Um, and we believe it's a great opportunity because then we can combine them with virtual learning. In general, student-led initiatives that engage young people in both shores of the Mediterranean can be the best way to work with virtual learning and also including training, discussions and workshops to make it as interactive as possible. So explore different formats that can be engaging for students and connect with outcomes. And then the last one is the multilateral cooperation also at the student level. What we have seen in different regions in ESN, and the best example is the Western Balkans, is that when we talk about multilateral collaboration, when we talk about cross-collaboration also between countries in the same region, eh, we do not always think about the role of grassroots, about the role of students, but the high-level initiatives should always be complemented with small actions that will bring people together and help, for instance, to improve south-to-south -south mobility. Uh, we, we are saying this because the creation of international networks where students can engage with peers from across the world or from across Europe and the Mediterranean in general can also lead to more connections between students from the same region. So if we engage our students in international networks, this will result on more students getting to know other partners, other friends from other countries in the Mediterranean and in the end also participating in mobilities, participating in collaboration projects, with them. So this is also that we have seen from experience and that we really hope will get more attention in the next few years. And now, yes, you can continue. Okay, so for us on a capacity building side, we have, well, ultimately we're, as you can see, a student network, right? And we're pan-European in a sense, but as Juan has mentioned, we're looking to expand. From our perspective, we want to see a lot more student representation and even student bodies in the South Mediterranean. 
And realistically, for us to be able to expand in, into the South Med, we would need this, right? And that's why we have projects such as with Stilab. Uh, that's why we're working so closely with EMN to build capacity in terms of understanding internationalization and being able to have actual representatives. With Stilab as well, we're also looking to train them in soft skills because in ESN, we like to think of ourselves as experts in this area from a student perspective, given the, the multitude of experiences we have had to have. We like to also think in ESN that it's almost like a training ground for real life for us. I mean, the stakes are quite low, but you'd like to think that you'd have the same opportunity for these for students in the South Med. Um, so for us, this is super, super key. And as you can imagine, it's difficult if it's only coming from a staff perspective. I mean, if you don't already have formulated networks in, in the South Mediterranean, it's hard to get that student understanding that voice, especially if they don't have the experience. And that's where we come in and we have a multitude of experience across our network, what students need. So this is where it's super key. Um, and yeah, we believe we can bring up those relevant issues and actually empower that student body um, or have student bodies in the South Med. Um, okay. Then data-driven approach. So it's very easy to talk about concepts without really backing up with information and data. And even we believe this um, as a student organization. On our side, we like to have our insights, but it's based on facts. It's based on things that we've seen through our regular ESN surveys that we take. As, as recently, we have our, our survey in 2021 on, on mobility post, uh, post COVID or during COVID um, and understanding the process of what people have been through. Um, but having these insights makes it so much easier to actually formulate your plans and justify them, um, especially from a student perspective and understanding the real needs, right? So from our side, this is super, super important to have that quantitative side, which isn't always present. Sometimes it's just discussion and you know, people trying to understand what is best, but we, we believe in a quantitative approach. Yeah, furthermore, so this one's a big one, um, combating stereotypes. This is something where I think ESN can play a very, very big role. We have a network practically across Europe and we can see through even our network, yes, there's differences in culture, differences in seeing things, even in, in religion, uh, in ways of life. But the one thing that unify, unifies us is our values. Um, and these values are mobility, open-mindedness, and having this international perspective. And we believe that, look, it doesn't really matter where you come from, us having these, these local organizations in Europe, everyone has these common values. And we'd like to see this in the South Med as well. And I don't see why, why religion or anything else or culture should be, should be a deterrent from that. Um, and that's why for us, a great way of doing this is the students that go to the Mediterranean uh, on exchange, on Erasmus of any sort, should go back and engage in their local communities and their universities to promote going to these regions. And this is something we can definitely engage in a lot more and be more proactive on at the local level. Um, I mean, beyond that as well, what I'd love to see is things like having our, our Mediterranean Erasmus generation paper and having an actual kind of campaign where we can reference something more concrete to show this is something that we, we really care about and we really believe in and to expand the definition of Erasmus in people's minds because sometimes it is a bit too European and it should be beyond, it really should. So um, yeah, this is super, super important for us. I could, I could go on about this all day because for me it's quite personal as well. Um, but for sure, I mean, this is something that ESN can provide. I mean, again, wider network of Europe. If we can collaborate well with, with student organizations that will hopefully come into fruition in the South Med, perfect. And then this is also very key, right? You may want to go on mobility, great, but how do you access the information? And how do you keep going without giving up? Because it's difficult to, to get a visa to, to figure out whether you would fit into the culture, whether there is something on the other side to support you. This is why we're working on this Erasmus Generation portal, which we're hoping in the next year or so will become available. And we're hoping to expand it to South Med countries because for us, it's again, it's not purely a European focus, it is beyond. And it isn't just an Erasmus focus as well, it's beyond in terms of mobility programs. It's meant to be a portal that allows for people to understand where they can go and get the key information they need very, very quickly. This is, this is something that we're tangibly bringing to the table and we want to expand it to, to South Med. Uh, and beyond, as I've said. So yeah, and especially the fact that it's centralized. Um, also, we want to see things like student experiences on there to make it, again, more relatable to students, right? Because at the end of the day, students relate to students best. So um, this is super, super key for us. And yeah, we, uh, I guess we hope you, uh, you enjoyed our presentation, you enjoyed our, 
our insights. Unfortunately, it was only 10 to 15 minutes long, so you kind of want to go deeper into a topic, but um, yeah, we're, we're more than available for the questions after and any follow-up discussions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Yasin. And I was sure that you, in a few minutes, you will be able to touch very interesting points. And I take also some notes, and we will come back on this during the QA session. And but for sure, the combating stereotypes and uh, quality accessible information are things that we can surely work together. And we need your help and support to to improve our capacity uh on this um, as you know we are discussing it's not an easy task but something that we would like to to do in the coming years uh, to have uh, not only the unimed assembly in the unimed week in brussels but also a unimed students event uh to contribute to this obviously you know that is not easy because uh, it's first of all how to find the right budget to to uh, to have people with us to invite students but i think that is something that we can work on uh, with our members of, of course i hope also with the other institutions like the information but also european commission in itself and obviously esn uh, to find a way to organize at least a pilot initiative for this and to have a students event that surely help us uh, to see in which direction we have to go to include more and more students in university life. And as you already mentioned, this the red project, which is an important, an important project for, in this sense. But we will discuss on this in, in another session also. I have a little change in the agenda because as you probably can understand, our colleague from Egypt, Mayada Belal, she is in a very nice hotel at the moment for a conference, I suppose. And she has now, she has to move now to a workshop. I, I think that we can anticipate a, a speech in Mayada from uh, L1 University, but also she is also, uh, she was in charge for UFM report, also the cooperation with the, uh, the Egyptian Ministry of Higher Education. Uh, please, Mayada, you have 10 minutes for your intervention. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank, thank you, Marcello. And uh, let me first, um, uh, allow me first to, to send you my greetings from the sunny Cairo. Um, I'm talking to you now from one of the landmark hotels in Cairo overlooking the Knights Marriott Hotel. And now I wish that we could have this workshop or this week physically uh, here in Cairo in this uh, wonderful hotel. Uh, let me uh, share my presentation. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm sure the presentation right now. Can you see the, my presentation or not? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. And something to control. Okay. Can you see it now? Now, yes. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> if you could go, perfecto. Perfect. Yeah, Thanks. perfect. Yes. Uh, let, let me first uh, um, try to um, uh, explain this logo. This logo is for Nefertiti, which is one of the wonderful uh, ancient Egyptian queens, and she's wearing the, the cap. And if she is there now, she will also wear the, the gown as well. This is to, uh, to talk about her education in Egypt. Well, uh, I wouldn't take more than 10 minutes, the, the time allocated for the presentation. Uh, I will first focus on the challenges that we currently facing in the public universities of Egypt. Uh, and when, then I will move to some ideas in order to, um, in, in order to enhance the internationalization in Egypt. But let me first uh, explain that there is a um, kind of uh, reform of higher education in Egypt. And the strategy now is uh, uh, to, to go more for internationalization of higher education, particularly for those newly established higher education institution, in institutes in Egypt, including the national universities, 
um, the international branch campuses and the technological universities. Uh, but maybe I will uh, focus on the challenges that are um, facing most of the national uh, of the public universities. Still, uh, despite the fact that we are diversifying all the higher education types in Egypt, however, still the public universities uh, contribute to the in, with a major chunk actually uh, uh, from the, the graduates in Egypt. They produce almost 78% of the total graduates from tertiary education. This is maybe the reason I will focus on uh, the public uh, universities in Egypt. The challenges, are, I believe that most of them are common with other uh, universities from the Mediterranean. Uh, however, maybe we, we have some a uh, few differences uh, in Egypt. Um, if we go to the challenges, I, I maybe I classify them into two types of challenges, the what, what are related to governance and the others. What are related to governance that most of our uh, public universities in Egypt, we do not have the International Relations Office and I will uh, refer to them as IROs, uh, as part of the University Organica. So um, most of the IROs with its uh, bylaws and different structures are um, uh, based on individual initiatives and uh, individual uh, contribution from uh, faculty staff uh, of our universities. Uh, also, we do not have in our university organogram, we do not have particular post for uh, vice president, or uh, I would say vice rector, for internationalization in the university and for the, the schools or the faculties, we do not have vice dean for internationalization as well. Um, one of the obstacles that might uh, hinder the, the, uh, the uh, efforts or endeavors for internationalization of most of our universities is there is loose ties between different schools within the same university. Uh, particularly, we, we do have a lot of universities that are having lots of campuses. We do not have a, a particular campus for un, one university. A uh, particular university might have up to 2, 12 or 13 different campuses. So the, the ties between different schools uh, are a bit loose. Um, also, sorry for this. Uh, but there, there is also no commitments from um, some of the deans of our school for international activities. Uh, some, some of them they do not, um, they, they do not consider international activities as part of their mandate or their jobs. Uh, this, this is what are related more for uh, governance for the other uh, obstacles or other challenges. Uh, in most of our public universities, there is no uh, internal specific fund allocated for international activities. Um, so sometimes the, there are some funds for uh, scholars' uh, mobility. However, the most of the international activities are not covered uh, by particular funds from the university budget. Um, also, there is lack of networking between different IROs of our Egyptian universities. Um, language barrier is another, maybe another uh, obstacle or another challenge. And uh, I can see that this is a part of the challenges that are facing uh, the mobility of the faculty and the mobility of students in most of the countries. Uh, language barrier is, is also an obstacle here in Egypt. Um, Recognition of international credits, particularly that most of our academic programs, the main, uh, I would say the mainstream programs in our Egyptian universities, uh, are not following the European Credit Plus Fair Hours, uh, so that we we are facing some challenges in case of the short mobility, in, in particular for our uh, university students for the recognition of their credits. Um, lack of qualified stuff at most of IRO, IROs, and I think, I think it's, it's no surprise and no secret to say this because most of our international relations offices at our uh, universities, they are newly established. 
and the, the staff of, uh, of most of those uh, offices um, are, uh, are trying to, to uh, have their um, training or the capacity building conference on their uh, initiative communication with fund agencies or other sources in order to, uh, to gain experience and the know-how of managing uh, international offices. Uh, also, uh, one of the, the problems that we are uh, currently facing uh, at uh, most of our universities is not um, providing the faculty staff with some incentives to, uh, to contribute or to participate in international activities. Uh, they, they are overloaded with overwhelming work from the, 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 the faculty load, the um, research, uh, their uh, quality and other administrative staff uh, that they, they have to do in their uh, schools and there is no time or, or no incentive given to them in order to um, to better uh, engage them in international activities. Um, also, uh, long and complicated procedures for the approval needed for most of the international activities. This is also another uh, uh, obstacle or uh, roadblock. Um, however, still um, our potential at our universities are enormous and in order maybe to, to unlock this uh, potential, um, there, there are some ideas or done some measures that if they are uh, uh, taken or followed, we, we might um, overcome most of the challenges of uh, already uh, explored. Uh, to start with the, 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 the measures they taken by the Minister of Higher Education Scientific Research is to integrate the IROs in the university organograms. Uh, I think this will, will empower those uh, IROs and uh, uh, will enable them to do their work uh, perfectly and uh, professionally. Uh, also to develop an uh, IRO bylaw um, to, 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 have, to have it like a Bible or a guideline for the, those newly established IRO or to the, because we still have like four or five universities that do not have an IRO yet, so they can um, have this as a guideline for them. Um, Towards the process of approval, approval needed for international activities, this will also foster um, those kinds of uh, activities and encourage the faculty staff to proceed in them. Um, encourage networking among the Egyptian universities. And I can't, this is something I, uh, I, I believe that uh, that can easily be done uh, through uh, different uh, events and conferences in order to bring people together and put them in contact together, encourage them for more cooperation. Um, also uh, to draw a map of internationalization, higher education is concrete objectives and all the the universities uh, have to follow this uh, uh, strategy and have to achieve or to work in order to achieve those concrete objectives. Uh, and also something very important, uh, uh, I would our, 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 uh, uh, like to uh, uh, draw your attention for is to redirect the, the fund available from different international fund agencies if there is a fund allocated to, to Egypt in terms of a number of uh, funded projects. So the, the ministry is having crucial uh, role and they can uh, play this key role in order to redirect the, the fund in order to, um, to uh, achieve the, the, the objectives uh, previously uh, drawn or identified by the Minister of Higher Education towards enhancing the internationalization in Egypt in higher education. I mean. uh, for the universities, they, they still have um, a key role in enhancing internationalization. Um, Maya, if you can conclude in one minute, please. I'm sorry? If this you is... can conclude in one minute. Just in please. one minute, yes. OK, this is actually this is the last uh, slide, OK? So the, the, they, provide, they might provide incentives for faculty to better engage in international activities, empower the IROs, um, 
uh, establish the necessary measures to connect the, the different faculties all together and um, uh, facilitate the, the tools needed for, uh, to conduct any kind of international activities. Uh, also to provide training for university uh, senior management deans, uh, has of uh, the fish divisions uh, in order to uh, support, better support actually internationalization and of course facilitate the credit integration. I'm sorry for taking uh, more time than the uh, time allocated to my presentation, but this is uh, the presentation I'm, I'm done now and I'm ready for any question if there is any. And if not, um, I'm sorry to uh, to leave this important uh, meeting uh, for another day. Thank you, Mayada. I have uh, several questions because it seems that the Egyptian system uh, is uh, not so much interested to internationalization, at least in the governance dimension of universities. And I think there is something to, to discuss and to debate how to find solutions, as you said, to answer to this uh, lack of interest of lack of organization. But uh, it's a pity that you are not able to stay with us all during all of the time. And I hope that we will have surely in the coming weeks uh, occasion to debate and to discuss and why not to organize another focus group with Egyptian universities to go more in detail about your recommendations and the report in itself and our recommendations uh, that we brought together and to try to identify some solution at least from our side. And obviously, please. Um, Marcello, if you allow me to comment on this, um, uh... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that my presentation gave you an impression that the higher education in Egypt are not interested in internationalization. Uh, I, I can say something like this because internationalization is actually one of the uh, it's a core of the pillar of our new strategy in Egypt for higher education. However, maybe the focus is given for the, the new higher education institutions uh, in, in this stage. However, uh, the, the public universities, they are the ones um, I was focusing on, but, but the entire strategy for higher education in Egypt is, is focusing and, and uh, giving a very close eye on internationalization. Okay, but obviously uh, we can't do that without the important public universities, for instance, yes. that we have in your country, and the, yes. I always mention the size of Cairo University, a quarter of a million of students, you know, and it is an important player in the region. And for sure, they could be stronger, not only Cairo University, but also all the other universities, public yes. in particular. Yes. But I think that there is room for discussion for sure. And we will, we have to do something more also from my side, from the side of UNIMED for, for sure. Maybe, maybe because I'm, I'm practicing uh, internationalization in higher education in public universities 10 years ago. This is maybe the reason I'm deeply digging into the problems, the real problems and trying to focus on them. No, 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 exactly, exactly. Okay. Thank you very much Thank again. You. Ada, you gave me also the opportunity to change our schedule, our agenda. I think that we can put at the end the presentation of my colleagues. I uh, thank you for your comprehension, uh, Marco, and Lawrence, and Martina. And I move now to the president of the University of Tripoli, Professor Khaled Hun. Uh, Professor Hun, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. You are a new elected president, uh, recently new elected president of the University of Tripoli. Just mention that most probably I, I will try, at least I will try to be in Tripoli in November. And I hope that we will be able to organize some uh, meeting uh, with the other Libyan colleagues. But please, the floor is yours. Okay, Marcello, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I will leave you here now. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye, my dear. See you. Bye, bye. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Very well. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me to be among you today and to share with you some of the ideas we have about internationalization in general. And accordingly, I hope that what I will say falls into context with the theme of this 
event because I speak in general. Uh, first of all, I concur with uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Mayada, and almost all what she said, the structural problems they have are almost uh, similar to ours. The only advantage we have is that international, uh, the International Cooperation Office is uh, well entrenched in the, in the system of the Libyan universities and it's decreed by law. It's, and it's positioned uh, relatively high because it, 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 it works under the supervision of the vice rector of the university. And uh, in practical ways, it, it is also uh, followed very scrutinely by the rector himself. Today, I am going to speak about five points, which I think are the main goals and challenges we are facing in the University of, uh, of Tripoli. Internationalization to us uh, means that we, it is a way for us to calibrate our system. Our system, uh, as I hope you know, is based on the American system, the American semester system and the entire the entire program is uh, a direct copy from the American system since the uh, initiation of the university. And we are working with that system all the way through and we inherited all it, its advantages and disadvantages. Now we are moving forward and we hope that we can impose some external audit by calibrating our system against the European norms. And um, there is a uh, serious move now to implement the European credit transfer system in order to facilitate for, for our students and uh, the mobility and in order for us to see whether the workload we are imposing on the students conforms with the European uh, norms or uh, sometimes we think it's more than what's, what is needed. And we are putting too much load on the students. The second point uh, is that by interna internationalization, we think that we will be able to implement a modern governance system, which will allow us to reform our chain of decision-making in the university. We will try to learn from the European system and see how things work and modify our course so that we um, implement more modern methods of governance. The third point is that we, from the internationalization, we hope to enhance our cooperation with Europe in general and with the universities, Med Mediterranean universities in particular, and look forward for joint programs, regional programs, rather than bilateral programs. This will uh, eventually help us in the fourth point, which is uh, we are looking forward to establishing networks that will help us engage more seriously in the next bit of Erasmus Plus projects. We are on our way now to uh, establish regional networks with uh, neighboring countries, un universities, and uh, further afield universities in the Mediterranean, and hope that by establishing su such networks, establishing, establishing uh, uh, projects of common interest and of regional uh, importance, and then uh, move forward towards applying for uh, medium or uh, large projects from the European Un Union. Finally, uh, last but not least, of course, the mobility of students and professors is very important to us. And uh, it has started already, but uh, very modestly, we wish to uh, work on that and increase it. And uh, the, the goal is quite obvious. We would like to expose ourselves to different schools of thought, different trends of research, and uh, 
this will also bring us to the point where people will start uh, competing for places for exchange, which in its way is a goal because it will, it will enhance the system and uh, improve the quality of the students and the professors alike. Of course, you all, you, you all know that in the past two years, we had a severe civil strife and uh, I am very thankful to the UNIMED because they did not disconnect us and they continued working with us and the projects we, you, you discussed and uh, approved with uh, Dr. Adr Diaf are working and we have now in place two university degrees, joint degrees with, with, the, with the European universities. We wish, we wish to go along that line further and further and uh, uh, Dr. Adel Diaf have my full support and my full attention, and uh, I look forward to uh, meet uh, Professor Marcello Scalesi when he comes to Tripoli, and you are all welcome if you want to visit the University of Tripoli. Thank you very much. Thank you, dear President, for your intervention. I think that you touched on some points that we consider for the region important and of course, uh, extremely important also for, for Libya that is in a way we could consider a, a newcomer in the program, in the Euro Erasmus program, but you know that UNIMED started many, many years ago with to cooperate with the Libyan universities. And we are proud that we are in a way the most financed organization for Libyan projects. And uh, I think, and you are, you are right, the, the European Commission has to do something more. And I hope in particular, I know that for mobility, they would like to do more. And we have to engage ourselves jointly to, to, to catch the opportunity coming from Erasmus Plus International Trade Mobility, but also other programs to improve the mobility of Libyan students and staff and professors, we, because we need to, uh, uh, to show to our partners in Europe, but also in Southern Mediterranean countries in the region and itself, that the Libyan university system is there, is active, and uh, there are very good universities, and obviously that they need to be involved in this operation that I mentioned. Thank you very much. We will come back after for some questions about the Libyan universities. Now from Libya, we move to... Excuse me, uh, uh, Dr. Please. Adel will take those questions. I have to leave you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you personally soon in, in Tripoli, or if in case you are planning to come to Italy, you are most welcome also in Rome. I, we now move to Palestine, to our friend and colleague, Kerie Rassas from uh, University of Naja in Nablus. She is vice president for international cooperation at the university, but uh, she's an important player in the country. Please, Kerea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcello. Hello, colleagues and friends. I hope that everybody's still keeping in full energy. So, um, Internationalization of higher education institutions is a way not only to establish academic exchange to its highest standards, but also to enhance the quality of higher education and research. So we have established an extensive and well-structured framework for sustainable and global engagement through UNIMED and its growing partnerships and initiatives tailored to integrate more internationalization into our local higher education systems. So in Palestine, there's an insistent need for internationalizations, internationalization as barriers, siege and restrictions imposed by the Israeli occupation weaken our national economy, impeding its capacity to absorb new graduates. So this is seen as a contributing factor of high rates of unemployment, underemployment, and an obstacle for many graduates to work outside the country. Therefore, we at the higher education institutions are exerting earnest efforts in bringing international dimensions into our universities and raising the international horizon of students. 
with tens of initiatives and projects executed especially by the EU in terms of Tempus, Erasmus, FP7, Horizon and others. So our fragmented work towards internationalization turned into more consolidated and structured um, efforts. So this keeps us wondering in an era where a global knowledge of knowledge society has been created, what is the accomplished impact of internationalization in Palestine? Are we even close to fulfill our goals while acknowledging that every society has its own requirements in reference to higher education and labor market uh, needs? It's also important to take into consideration that all higher education institutions can benefit from the policies and practices of others uh, around the world. So uh, institutional wise, um, there are transformation dimensions that we need to examine. Leadership and structure, curriculum, institutional commitment and policy, partnerships and network, faculty and staff support, and mobility. Um, in Palestine, internationalization is doubly important as it faces occupation along with shortage of natural and financial resources. So furthermore, the higher education system is relatively young and severely affected by the continuous fiscal uh, crisis. So internationalization is an essential tool used to fill gaps of weakness in our local education system, where reform contributes to building uh, strong, competitive and resilient higher education um, institutions. Therefore, internationalization is a natural response to the political situation where students seek to be more global in order to access the international labor market, thus to bring international education to our students. A lot of academic programs were modified, updated and established depending on global trends and local community needs. Unfortunately, the political situation and the frequent flare-ups result in the reluctance of international students to visit Palestine, so we have some sort of mobility imbalance. Well, thanks to the financial assistance provided by no donors, especially the EU, and efforts by individual universities in applying to international standards in education, we managed to somehow control the brain drain and motivated more Palestinian students to study within our higher education system. Um, internationalization was adapted mainly through projects like in the past Tempus, FP7, Horizon and Erasmus+, Plus, which remarkably contributed in staff and research development and opened many doors for more exchange opportunities for students throughout tens of projects and initiatives. The question now is, did this manage to create a sense of belonging to the international community? And how to use the Erasmus Plus as an example? Did it manage to create a more employable European generation do we consider the Erasmus Plus a success story that needs to be reinforced? In the Palestinian case, we have shown solid commitment to establishing international relations and creating ties with wide range of accredited and well-recognized universities around the globe to ensure satisfying and efficient outcome. Internationally recognized students with global competences. The question remains, is the administrative staff at universities is also equipped to handle and facilitate internationalization? International officers at partner and potential partner universities should further liaise their work. A lot of universities in Palestine focus on international partnerships through scholarships, exchange programs, joint degrees, capacity building programs, and others. This approach not only helps us gain an institutional reputation, but also shows our openness to adapting more internationalization. The humble steps of internationalization within our universities have had positive improvement of institutional performance in rankings and in accreditations. Despite those difficulties, we want to focus more on inward mobility rather than only working on outward mobility. Exchange should be mutual and more beneficial. We aim for our universities to be more vibrant, hubs where students are, are brought together from nations around the world. Core elements of internationalization are missed due to the difficulties imposed by the occupation. These efforts remain at stake due to Israeli occupation and denying visas to students and scholars visiting Palestine, not to mention movement restriction imposed on Palestinians who wish to travel and study or even train abroad, especially those from Gaza. So we, we need to stop thinking of 
and exclusively of mobility as the solo element of internationalization. Instead, we need also to think to drag our attention to internationalization of the curriculum at our universities and switch from physical mobility to virtual mobility. And COVID-19 has taught us a lesson in that aspect and exchange and paving the way to more collaborative platform for online international learning. In this context, online degrees, micro-credentials and not um, given the needed, uh, they're not need, uh, given the needed um, recognition. So the needed steps for more practical and proactive strategic plan for the North-South partnership and in the case of Palestine, to capitalize on the existing local, regional and international networks and collaborations to ensure a trans more transformative impact on the higher education system and institutions to mobilize partnerships inland and abroad, mobilize international organizations, governments, universities, and the civil society to guarantee the strengthening of international dimension of education, solutions for recognition of online learning and degrees, since in Palestine, online learning is still not uh, recognized, establishing administrative structure that facilitates, motivates, processes related to internationalizing universities. Liaison with partner universities should be stronger and more extensive, including interdisciplinary cooperation on various fronts and levels across faculties, students, staff, international relations departments, scholars and professors. Find concrete and fair solutions for accreditation between uh, credit hours and courses taken within Palestinian universities. We use the American system especially for fellowships and internships, while in Europe they use the, um, a different system. To introduce and announce an active signed agreements to be more inclusive of all areas of bilateral cooperation. And we wish for the growing global cooperation in higher education to serve as a pivotal tool to, to develop research capacity in line with the SDGs. Now, um, at COVID times, the higher education system has been impacted significantly by the rapid spread uh, of, the pan of the pandemic. The Palestinian institutions did not only survive the pandemic, but also managed to fully switch to e-learning, expand and acquire higher international ranking, despite all financial and logistics uh, difficulties. The, this time represented an opportunity to examine our ability to work virtually to be in the heart of the international efforts to combat COVID-19 and any future global threats. We've also established the Global Health Institute at al Najah University to join forces to promote health for all and share knowledge globally, technically, scientifically, and academically. To conclude, we all know that the knowledge knows no boundaries and no borders. It capitalizes and grows as it flies across countries and cultures. So our series of meetings with UNIMED is one solid example of collective work to create and share knowledge. I'm sure that the discussions made represent a building block for more tangible initiatives and projects that will contribute to generate solutions for the obstacles. And only by investigating the present and investing in the, our future, by unlocking door for youth, we'll be able to create a platform of sustainability and prosperity. Sadly, and unlike other countries, the higher education internationalization opportunities and success are linked to the political sphere as barriers, war, siege, closures, and movement restrictions surround our youth and confiscate their rights to education. Through, through this framework, we will advocate for this right and will continue to change facts on the ground together. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly, for perfect on time, first of all, but more important, you touched several very challenging and interesting points, not only related to the Palestinian situation, but generally speaking, I think for the entire education system and Mediterranean region. Uh, just on the line about micro-credential that you mentioned, Tomorrow we will have a webinar with the European Training Foundation to talk about this because we are trying to better understand how it's possible to transfer this uh, European debate around micro credential and so on to SoftNet and why not to see the way to, to cooperate on this in the coming projects. But again, you mentioned several issues one another one is the importance of projects because at the end of the day projects is the way to do concrete things together 
and to try to launch a message to a project that change is possible, working together is possible to achieve important results and not just waiting that something happens. And thank you very much for your uh, speech, but we will come back on this during the QA session. Now from Palestine, we move to Morocco to our friend Selim Bounou. Selim is in charge, is vice rector in charge of cooperation, international relations at the Euromed University of Fes, which is labelized by Union for Mediterranean, as was already mentioned during the chat by Madame Ben Abdallah. Please, Selim. Thank you very much. Merci Thank you. beaucoup, mon cher ami. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui, oui. Parfait. Merci beaucoup, mon cher ami euh, euh, Marcello. Ça fait très longtemps et, et je pense que c'est une excellente opportunité pour moi, en tout cas, de te voir et de voir euh, les nouveaux collègues que, que, euh, que je viens de découvrir. Merci. Merci encore pour l'invitation. Uh, uh, just how, how, how much time do I have to... 10 minutes, 10, 10 15 minutes? 10 minutes. You can speak speak in English or in French. We have interpretation service as you prefer. Very good. I will try to 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 give my talk in English. So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, very uh, interested uh, when I received this invitation from Marcelo and the, and the team. Obviously, even uh, within the same Mediterranean countries some universities are more advan advanced uh, than other in terms of internalization. Uh, a priority uh, internalization activity and funding uh, are different uh, from university to other university, as some uh, may be very far behind. However, there are some activities that are necessary for the internalization process and every university should aspire to achieve. Uh, uh, among these priority uh, for uh, uh, these internalization activities can be the transfer of knowledge and culture through mobility program among students, uh, staff, professors, conferences, seminars, etc. As such, Mediterranean universities should uh, uh, strive to attract foreign talent students uh, uh, and teachers also, uh, and the researcher. This will be increase the diversity within these universities and uh, represents an opportunity through uh, uh, which students can easily integrate into the international community uh, given the international experiences, uh, they will encounter while they receive uh, their education. Our university, from the side of University of Euromed, we have this kind of value uh, in the DNA of the university. So this is something very important to be done before starting any strategy or any any uh, techniques or processing to to have this uh, internalization mediterranean universities should also aspire to send their students and professor abroad either within the framework of uh, exchange program like erasmus or within the framework of other culture culture and research program which is uh, which will uh, allow them to acquire more international experience in helping them both in success in their career and to bring uh, this uh, uh, knowledge uh, acquire uh, back to their home university this is mainly uh, the objective uh, uh, for this uh, internalization from the side of our university and uh, in general in Morocco. Several models uh, are being tested and produced in Morocco. I will take this case uh, uh, from the side of Morocco. Some universities with uh, which often start with exchange program in which students are 
offered either a double degree from separate university or two separate degree in general. And this activity, it started since uh, a few years uh, here uh, around the university, the universities in Morocco. There is also another model of academic partnership between countries and universities in which the transfer of culture and knowledge is facilitated by joint research program uh, 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 and uh, conferences and seminars and uh, uh, also exchange program in which students are supervised by foreign teachers and foreign researchers among many other uh, uh, tools. And finally, some universities use the foreign campus model also. However, this model requires a lot of financial uh, uh, means. And this model uh, obliges university to establish campuses abroad to offer their students and professors the possibility of uh, benefiting uh, uh, from the international experiences. Uh, I can't, uh, I will say some recommendation, it's not recommendations, but it's like a, a proposition. A successful example uh, in my mind of higher education internalization initiatives in Mediterranean region came from uh, uh, Israel country and we should to be more attracted and more offensive to, 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 to understand uh, 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 this kind of success. Why? Because government programs such as the multi-annual plan for higher education launched in 2016 are implemented to promote and finance the internalization of higher education. And this is the target point. Uh, it's very important to understand this kind of uh, uh, top-down uh, 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 top uh, uh, directives, if, if we can say that. All universities, including uh, our university, aspire to become an international hub for higher education. This is like a, 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 a big objective for every university. From Morocco's uh, point of view, we must launch initiatives covering area relevant of, to this internalization, to be attractive for more international students, to develop the international skills for Moroccan students, to improve this capacity building uh, actions between higher education institution and also to strengthen international research link because uh, in the majority research link can enhance this capacity of mobility and capacity for uh, uh, knowledge transfer. So to do this, uh, uh, a, regular, a regulatory a framework to promote and finance this internalization of higher education should be very considered. We must be more daring to aspire all the, the, the values acquired by uh, the, 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 the world of internalization. So today the Erasmus Plus program is the main ongoing program at national uh, at the national level, which provide funding for students to uh, to study abroad. This program should also offer specific program for universities in 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 the south of the Mediterranean, and something uh, uh, to be uh, interesting to to recommend. We can say uh, that the process of this internalization in the Mediterranean in, uh, is a process that remain to be worked on. First of all, we need more initiatives. We need, uh, second, to put in place 
the necessary assessment tools to track the process of this initiative to uh, maximize, in order to maximize benefits and address potential challenges as they uh, arise. And third, uh, to, to have a, a, a funding, and this is a serious obstacle to the development, the development of the internalization of higher education in the Mediterranean in general. Most Mediterranean universities depend heavily on public funding, which is not enough. We should also more partnership and agreement uh, to be signed with the international institution aimed at funding internalization initiatives such as research and staff and students mobility. And uh, uh, finally, to facilitate uh, and uh, uh, I see uh, Hamid Ben Aziza uh, uh, a posé une question. Hier, la France a décidé de réduire le nombre des visas pour les pays du Maghreb de 30% pour la Tunisie et de 40% pour le Maroc et de 50% pour l'Algérie. Et il dit encore un frein pour la mobilité et l'internationalisation de l'enseignement supérieur. Je suis tout à fait d'accord. I am totally agree with, with this question and facilitate the departure of students living uh, 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 visa problems, making this complex process more fluid. That will be some targets to be, uh, 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 to be done. So this is what I want to, to give you Come like informations and the recommendations and the discussions. Thank you very much, Marcelo, for this for, for your invitation. And uh, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much, uh, Selim. Uh, again, also in this case, you touched a very uh, important point from not only from your perspective, from your university, which is a particular case of university because it's international by definition, uh, and also with this uh, uh, under the umbrella in a way of Union for Mediterranean, which is a, a particular case uh, in the region jointly with EMUN. Uh, in Slovenia, and uh, I appreciate your your work, your your words in particular. Uh, what you are proposing about research, you touched also the, the, the issue of the visa that also our Secretary General, the Benatiza, which is a, an important task. But you know that the European Commission on this is working on, as always. It seems that they have two hands that they don't uh, talk to each other. Uh, with the new international trade mobility that we start from October, hopefully the deadline of the call will be again in February next year, they decided to, uh, to have this program on a regional basis. This means that they look at the region, not only at the, if every single country, but also they decided to balance the mobility and to, in a way to have all the countries all financed more or less at the same way. This, uh, obviously, I see the point that France is uh, limiting the, the, the visa for Moroccan students and for the Maghreb students and so on, but this could open other opportunity with other European countries. Mobility is there, university are there, I think that we have to look at the entire region and not only to focus on this, as also our report mentioned this, that there are countries that in a way depend totally from one country instead to have a very large international dimension. And this bridge, this link with just one country, obviously, you know, that could be its problem in a way because could affect for political decision from one day to another, uh, the, the mobility. But again, you mentioned correctly that internationalization is a, a process that must be 
uh, worked on day by day in a long term, in a long term issue. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know how to proceed now because we are close to in 20 minutes to the end. So I, I, I can ask Marco to see if they want not to do the, the entire presentation, but probably you already, uh, our speakers already say the most important elements related to the report. But I would like to ask Marco if you could summarize your uh, intervention in giving us few elements, but clear elements uh, for to improve the QA, uh, to, to, to go ahead with the QA session to, to see if there is some point that our participants would like to uh, go more in detail. I know that we are changing at the last minute our schedule, but I think that we are expect enough to manage this change. Marco, please. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, for, and also to the, all the speakers and all the panelists. Let me just share the screen in order to uh, have the opportunity to present some of the main elements of the, of the report. I hope first of all that you can see the screen and that, uh, that is like it is clear. Okay, so basically, what we are, uh, what we have here, uh, uh, what the panelists focused on, and the reflection that we heard from Palestine, Morocco, and also other um, other countries in Libya and Egypt are all coming out from the study that we put it under the umbrella of UFM. And uh, he, here you can see the cooperative work that we did together internally at UNIMED for defining the report. And this report has been so uh, focused on the quantitative and qualitative research. And so we have the external expert, Maria Giulia Vallatore, the quantitative that has supported us, and she supported us in the sense. We also have other colleagues that some of them are, the, the majority of them are, are here in the behind the scene working also today for, for this webinar. And uh, Nero, Federica, Michael, Federica Limul, and also you can easily read all the lists. And also my colleague and Lawrence and, uh, and Martina are here in video ready to, to support the discussion. You can download the uh, full report in the link that we have on the website of the Union for the Mediterranean, and you will find the whole report that, as mentioned by some panelists, is around 200 pages. So it's a huge work uh, that we did in six months altogether uh, uh, internally at Union. The second slide, we have some numbers here, and the numbers are important because are not, not always numbers are full. Um, explanatory, but in this case, the numbers can really support all of us in understanding the amount of information that we collected, but to the quality, apart from the content. We had 10 countries, first of all, uh, from Morocco to, uh, to Palestine, including uh, also Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Mauritania, uh, and uh, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco. Uh, we worked for six months. Uh, it was very tough, but extremely interesting uh, work by analyzing internationalization uh, generally gen as a whole, not regarding only one dimension. The, the colleagues from the European uh, Student Network mentioned the mobility and the fact that mobility is only, uh, the internationalization is perceived only as mobility. And this is really something that I know that uh, uh, is a wrong perception. And the sense, and also uh, Professor Rossas explained us before that we have to wipe our uh, focus on, on that. We collected uh, 16 inspiring practices uh, and we entered in contact with 76 aggregate education institutions by creating a sample of institution for each country and trying to be as much representative as possible of the relevant results. In some cases, we succeeded. In some cases, there were some problems that we explained in the methodology. So apart from higher education institution, we had the opportunity to focus also on stakeholders. And stakeholders for us are all those 
those people that were interested in working with the South Med region, and especially with uh, with higher education, so uh, ex people that can from Europe or even from local from from the countries from within that can provide um, an insight for us and can and also provide us different perspective with respect to what we try to do at the beginning. Um, let me say also that all our theories, hypotheses, and theses have been validated, modified, and also uh, um, yeah, validated, modified according to the results of nine focus groups that we had. There, is, there are nine focus groups per 10 countries, namely we didn't have any reply from Israel, so there is no focus group for Israel. But basically for, for all the other countries, we had focus groups. And having focus groups with all those countries allowed us, again, to test our results and to adapt our results to the real. So it's been a real, uh, real challenge to do all of this in six months. Uh, we also had three thematic boxes focused on recognition of qualification, internationalization at home, and impact of cooperation agreement. Uh, and after six months, after all this kind of work uh, on daily basis done together, we had, in the final report, we have 10 country boxes. And here you can find the report also in its printed version. Uh, 10 country boxes, 29 regional recommendations, and 38 national recommendations. From the regional perspective, we went into the national perspective and vice versa, trying to mix the two perspectives and trying to understand that basically, uh, 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 and I know Martina has something to say on that later on, giving the discussion and the question and answer session. The South-South cooperation must be done not only on, on the basis of the geographical closeness or even uh, the geographical area, but on the real things that are shared, on the needs that are shared, and the opportunities that are shared at the national level. And last but not least, the student perspective. Uh, we received 3,300 questions, not we, mainly uh, Laurence did the whole job regarding students, and this 3,300 question that we answered, that we received, it really allowed us to have uh, a partial but interesting representation of the student, of the student's work, and of the student perception on mobility, and the student perception on, um, on why they're going to mobility, what are the reasons behind, where they would like to go, why they're moving from one country to another. So trying really to have Apart from stereotypes, an insight on their point of view and on mobility. Uh, so I had also another slide on Mentimeter, but it seems to me that we are skipping the Mentimeter presentation. So basically, we can move to the question and answer. And uh, um, and so the floor is open for discussion. I can uh, I have already some question in mind, but the floor is first to this to the to the people who are attending here. Uh, if there are questions, please, please feel free to drop the question in the chat. We will take care of it. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I think that we can move to on Laurent, so we stop the uh, presentations. Obviously, if there are comments on Laurent and Martina, we can, uh, we can have uh, on Laurent. We have additional comments on Laurent and Martina. Um, yes, thank you, Marcello. Uh, a couple of um, additional elements coming from the report, just quickly while our um, participants uh, imagine some questions for the speakers. Um, among all our uh, interventions today, the um, issue of mobility has been raised in many uh, occasions since, uh, since uh, mobility is one of the key elements and tools and, and priorities when it comes to internationalization or education. Um, mobility and virtual mobility, virtual exchange. Uh, what came up from the report and what has been stressed in many occasions is that, um, and what we want to stress uh, is that um, we want to deconstruct the idea that virtual and physical are alternatives. They are complementary. One does not replace the other. They both bring benefits and opportunities, but they don't have to be intended as alternatives. A physical mobility is a priority, is an instrument for knowledge transfer, is an instrument for exchange, 
for a dialogue. Um, and on the other side, virtual mobility and virtual exchanges intended as two different aspects in, in, of this digital dimension of the exchange offer, digital, offer additional opportunities for skills development, for mutual understanding and for dialogue. Um, it, uh, as uh, it was um, underlined by Herie, it offered an opportunities during the pandemic and it will stay as a resource for the universities. While we still have, as uh, our Secretary General uh, Benjamin Zisa said in the, um, in the, in, in the chat, um, physical mobility does not have to be, um, does not have to um, have less attention. It still has to stay as a priority. Um, and um, another element uh, which comes from the recommendation of uh, our, from our report is that um, internationalization has to be understood in all its dimensions. Uh, so not only mobility, but all the dimensions related to internationalization, related to strategic planning of the international activities of the universities in a comprehensive perspective, uh, which uh, goes behind the geographical proximity, but as an instrument to tackle common challenges. There are challenges which are in common in, for the 10 countries. We have analyzed for the North, for the South. So we have to go behind just uh, intending the region as a geographical region, but as um, in, in, in cooperation to respond to common challenges, which go from the green transition to sustainable development, the blue economy, the digitalization, autonomy, and internationalization. So it's a way to, uh, to so what we aim is to support cooperation on a thematic basis to advance in the research on common teams and in this way, advance also and embrace the um, quality of the education offer. And in this sense, the importance of um, international on, of universities network and the work uh, as uh, of the networks as UNIMED is um, to support mobility, to support cooperation at all levels, and to reduce the fragmentation in international relations. So the region intended as and as a place, as a space for cooperation at all sense. Uh, and Rans, I'll leave you the floor if you want to add something more. Merci, Martina. Merci. Bonjour à tous. Euh, moi, je voulais simplement relever quelque chose qui a été dit notamment par, euh, par Mayada et qui reprend en fait la question de l'articulation des différents programmes de coopération, des différents outils qui existent, que ce soit les programmes Erasmus+, les programmes H2020, les programmes de coopération bilatérale ou les, les programmes qui sont financés par des organisations internationales et de le mettre en perspective avec la nécessité de définir un, une stratégie d'internationalisation. Parce que sans stratégie d'internationalisation, sans définition d'objectifs, de critères, de méthodologies de suivi, il est impossible de mesurer l'impact euh, que tous les programmes de coopération et d'internationalisation peuvent avoir sur l'université. Et donc, c'est pour ça qu enfin, que, que lors des, des entretiens et de, du travail d'analyse et des recommandations qu'on avait fait, on avait mis cette question-là de la définition d'un de, euh, plan stratégique lié à l'internationalisation, mais qui s'intègre dans le plan général de l'université, est absolument indispensable. Un, un élément aussi pour, par rapport à la, à la participation au programme Erasmus+, puisque c'est celle qui est, qui est ressortie comme la, disons, la, plus, la plus impactante au niveau de l'internationalisation, on avait aussi noté que la participation en fait, dépend beaucoup à l'intérieur enfin, de chaque pays et qu'il y a des universités qui sont encore éloignées de, cette, de cet outil. Et, mais il y a une nouveauté qui, vient de, enfin, qui sera dans le nouveau programme Erasmus+, là, qui va être, dont l'appel va être lancé prochainement, c'est qu'il va y avoir un volet spécifique dédié à l'accès à la coopération pour des universités qui n'ont jamais encore participé à des projets euh, capacity building. Donc, ça va être l'occasion de pouvoir élargir l'activité de renforcement de compétences, d'élargir le programme Erasmus pour qu'il soit encore plus inclusif et qu'il permette de, de favoriser la, disons, le, le renforcement de la gouvernance et de, de, des activités d'enseignement supérieur à l'échelle nationale. Enfin, une question, enfin, un point simplement, puisqu'on l'a mentionné, effectivement, le tout le travail qu'on a fait avec, la, avec les étudiants qui ont été euh, extrêmement nombreux à répondre à, no, à notre questionnaire, ce qui témoigne vraiment aussi de l'importance de que la mobilité a pour eux et de, la, de, de comment ils l'aperçoivent. 
Euh, on, a, on les a interrogés sur quatre dimensions euh, de savoir entre l'acquisition d'une langue étrangère, l'acquisition de compétences interculturelles, l'impact de la mobilité sur leur employabilité sur la, et la valeur ajoutée que ça pouvait conférer à leur curriculum, comment ils l'évaluaient. Euh, étrangement, alors la question de la langue étrangère effectivement est, est apparue, est sortie très, très disons, en, en, de façon importante. Mais la dimension qui revient le plus souvent et qui est la plus impactante est celle en fait, de l'acquisition des compétences interculturelles. Et ce, qui, ce que soulignait aussi notre, notre secrétaire général dans la chat, c'était qu'en fait, si on part en mobilité, c'est avant tout peut-être pour apprendre l'autre, pour mieux se connaître et pour, pour euh, travailler sur les préjugés. Et je voulais simplement mentionner qu'en fait, ces données-là concernent non seulement les témoignages de mobilité d'étudiants qui sont partis en Europe, mais aussi de ceux qui sont partis en mobilité dans d'autres pays du sud de la Méditerranée. Et c'est pourquoi nous aussi, on pousse beaucoup à une IMED pour essayer de renforcer la coopération sud-sud avec toutes les difficultés, avec tous les, les préjugés que ça peut avoir. Mais quand on voit à quel point c'est important pour la construction d'une région, euh, voilà, on, on, poursuit les efforts, euh, on poursuit les efforts en la matière. Et juste une dernière chose, parce qu'après, euh, je ne voudrais pas prendre trop de temps, c'était qu'il y avait aussi, en fait, on avait été un peu surpris que, à la fois les étudiants, mais même les collègues des universités avec lesquels on a fait les focus group, que la question de l'impact de la mobilité sur l'employabilité, en fait, soit perçue comme quelque chose qui n'est pas encore finalement si évident que ça. Euh, alors évidemment ça dépend de la, du type de mobilité, de la durée puisqu'on enfin, ne on peut pas comparer toutes les, les mobilités de court séjour et les longs, de, les longs séjours mais il y aurait aussi sûrement une piste à, explorer, à exploiter dans le renforcement du, des relations entre les bureaux des relations internationales et les bureaux euh, liaison entreprise ou les career centers pour euh, essayer de faire en sorte que les mobilités internationales ou les mobilités régionales soient mieux reconnues et mieux valorisées dans le parcours académique euh, des étudiants pour que ça change, que la perception sur l'employabilité soit, soit changée. Voilà. Marco, Merci. je ne sais pas. Merci, Marcello, je sais pas. Merci, Laurence. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup à Marco, Martina et Laurence pour votre intervention. Sorry again to, to, to change the agenda and to ask you to be more concise. Uh, waiting that our participants, I think that we could stay five minutes more than the forecast. I can't ask our participants if they have some question, but in the meantime, I have one question for all our uh, speakers, if I may. I would like to start with our uh, students, with our colleagues from ESN, if I may. Juan, you are not sleeping, you are still following the webinar. Thanks for that, I'm joking, of course. Uh, my question is about, you know, we discussed it, and Martina also uh, gave the last uh, ideas on the, this, the virtual dimension, the physical dimension, and that is not something that we have to think as in opposition, but to, to consider as a joint opportunity. And Lawrence also mentioned the, the survey that we did with the students in the region and was very, in few days, we collected 3,000 answers and we were astonished at the beginning. What is from your student per perspective and also from student organization perspective, uh, this idea of virtual exchange in uh, opposition of physical mobility, how to really combine, you already mentioned in your intervention, that is necessary to combine. But what, what the students think about? Yeah, I mean, I think we have a couple of things uh, that should be mentioned here. In general, we know that when students are asked about why they go abroad, the number, they, they name a number of things, right? They name, for instance, the, the, the possibility to create new friendships. They name language learning. They name also the employability component. So what we need to think is considering the priorities for the students, do online learning opportunities serve these purposes that the students want when they go abroad? Or, I mean, is it, are they enough or should they always be complemented with other things? In some cases, online learning can be a very good tool to improve language learning, but for sure it cannot be the only tool. I think that all of us who speak languages can really say, it's a very different thing to practice 
languages following courses and to go and interact with people on the ground. Or when we talk about cultural differences or, and cultural diversity, which is a fundamental topic for ESN, as Yas was saying before. Of course, I can have very interesting discussions with peers from across the world about how do we live our lives, how do we enjoy cultural traditions, but it's not the same as going there and enjoying these cultural traditions myself. So this is why I say before, the important thing is how we combine both elements. I would like to see more thoughts on this when we think about blended learning, right? Because for instance, anything that is related to brainstorming, coming up with ideas, designing projects, it cannot be done online in the same way as it can be done offline when we meet together. So when we design blended courses, we can take this into account. Uh, students and also organizations sometimes feel that when we talk about virtual learning, it's kind of a way to solve the inter internationalization problem, right? So business are complicated, funding is complicated, and then we have virtual learning to solve that. But I don't agree with that perspective. I, I like many aspects related to virtual learning. Also, as an organization with 15,000 volunteers spread around 42 countries, we do a lot of virtual learning, I can tell you. So, so we know very well how it works. And we know that it works much better when it's complemented. I'm going to give you a very practical example. Right before this event, we're closing our Erasmus upgrade training event. So we work with participants for four days physically. Now the work continues. Now the topics that we have discussed are going to be followed up with different online meetings, working group, online collaborative tools. So this is how you combine both things. Because of course, we cannot do everything on site. That's not possible. But if we have this mindset of how to use our tools, that's how we achieve the best possible impact. And the same for the student experience. Thank you, Juan, and thank you, Yasin, for your participation, for your contribution, and your intervention in explaining clearly the reason why we have a memorandum of understanding with you, because uh, you are so, so active and very, very, uh, give us very interesting contribution and uh, feedback. I move now to Morocco, to Salim. Thank you, and obviously, let's keep in touch. Salim. Uh, you mentioned the importance, there is a question, I come back to the question very soon, but first, I, my question to Selim. Uh, you mentioned the importance of, of internationalization. I know that in Morocco, you are, the Moroccan government now is starting a, a reform process for our education system. Obviously, that must, is under discussion. We will see probably the new government, uh, we'll see. Uh, but do you think that in terms of internationalization, do you know at least if internationalization in this reform process will uh, have a special space or this just an internal issues and you are, the reform system is not looking at how to improve internationalization for Moroccan universities? You are international enough, but obviously something more is possible to do. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, a good question, uh, Marcelo. This question, uh, maybe uh, just uh, I, I came back uh, uh, before giving uh, this answer from the government. And the government today for higher education uh, I have uh, launched a lot of discussion with different presidents of university to see how we can implement this multicultural uh, 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 process or mindset. Because uh, if I can share with you just uh, uh, some pillars that we consider very important to strengthen this kind of internationalization. This internationalization uh, 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 must come from top down and not from uh, students. Students, they can have a lot of questions, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, uh, concerns, 
but uh, it, it has been, uh, it should be very important to put this strategy from top down. And I can share with you uh, just a moment if I can share a PowerPoint uh, right now. 30 seconds, sorry, because we are, okay. Okay. Just if you can see, uh, in particular, this multidimensional skills, or we can say a pillars. Uh, if uh, in our university, as you can, as you say, uh, Marcelo, since a few minutes, that we are labeled by Union for Mediterranean. And we are uh, starting this university, giving uh, the score value, uh, the most important thing to be in place uh, as cutting edge education. And we include uh, first a pillar, it's multilingual, that will be mastering a third lingual languages, uh, additionally to French and uh, uh, in English. So this is something very important to, to have uh, this kind of, uh, of pillar uh, for all students from different kind of, of, of formation or for, for programs. Multicultural studies should be very important in, 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 in the education. And uh, this kind of cross-cutting uh, courses on history, on civilization, on common heritage and philosophy also, uh, this is like some soft, soft and professional studies and citizen, uh, 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 citizen skills. And the government today, the higher education, implements this kind of pillars uh, for the new uh, bachelor uh, uh, at, at the level of all universities here in Morocco, and to be very important to have this kind of uh, cross-cutting courses. Another thing is entrepreneurship. Uh, a student uh, should have this kind of innovation and creation in their mind. Today, uh, les études aujourd'hui, Marcelo, ce n'est plus les études comme avant. Nous partons de ce constat-là. Nous disons que aujourd'hui, la formation n'est plus comme avant. La formation a changé. La formation a complètement changé avec euh, ICT et tout ce qui est euh, technologie de l'information et de communication. Et aujourd'hui, nous sommes obligés comme administrateurs de changer cette philosophie et cette façon de faire. Et c'est pour ça que à l'université Oromé de Deves, we have uh, this kind of multidimensional skills that we should to put them for all students at the university. Another uh, pillar is the mobility. The mobility for students, the mobility for professors. This is mandatory. This is really mandatory for all uh, students, for all uh, professors, for all uh, administrative staff. And this kind of, 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 of pillars uh, uh, can bring uh, uh, the staff, uh, university staff uh, to another dimension. Social implication is very important also for students. We have some credits to give to the students for their implication in the social uh, in, the, in the society. We have also uh, a sustainable development. This is some uh, uh, thing that uh, uh, some pillars that I want to share with you and uh, the higher education, the Ministry of Higher Education inspire all the universities uh, for this kind of, of, of pillars to include them in the process for uh, the academic formation. Thank you very much, uh, Selim, uh, also for this uh, presentation. You said right the importance of, of for instance, of all the, 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 those elements were important, but in particular mobility for all. Uh, we are so 
touched about this issue of mobility, but at the end of the day, only the 3% of the students around the world have the opportunity to study abroad. It seems that we are discussing about nothing because the 3% was about the other 97. This is the reason why we have to guarantee as much as possible mobility opportunity, internationalization at home, virtual dimension, to create this international dimension, as also our colleague from Palestine, Kerye Assas, said, and this is the question for you, Kerye. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Palestinian uh, students that are international uh, in a way, per definition, because they have to have an international uh, background. Uh, but how is difficult? Uh, to manage this priority in the situation where you are. I attended a sort of presentation in front of students in Palestine, the Zayt University, some years ago. Uh, as European, I was attached in a way, obviously in a very kindly way, uh, because in a way I represent um, countries that are for maintaining the situation as it is, the status quo is unacceptable. How to the difficulties that you have in, in your university, but generally speaking, Palestinian education system, to work with students to explain how important is internationalization at the same time to face with all the problems that you mentioned. And also for your experience that you have, I would like that if you could answer to the questions in the chat by Cristina uh, Stefanelli related to the lack of internationalization strategies. What suggestion do you have for the newcomer or for the university that have a, a lack of experiences on how to make a plan of internationalization? It seems that there are two different questions, but I'm sure that you will be able in one minute to answer to both of them. Thank you, Kelly. Yes, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, to answer the first question, I mean, again, internationalization has three pillars, uh, political, technical, and financial and logistics. Now, the political one, which is the most challenging for us in Palestine, um, whether we're talking about incoming students or faculty or even outgoing, and even within the country itself, because, you know, uh, West Bank is completely separated from East Jerusalem, is completely separated from Gaza. So, um, so the poli and again, getting visas to Europe in terms of mobility for staff students and so forth. So the political one is a bit complicated and uh, I guess guess that my colleagues also in the uh, in North Africa and across the Mediterranean, Mediterranean share the same uh, difficulty somehow not to the extent of Palestine but that so we'll we'll leave this element apart for the time being now the fiscal part where the EU has generously you know invested uh, billions of euros in different programs and um, I've uh, cited the example of the Erasmus plus which has been a very successful example and we would like to call upon the European Union to you know to um, to renew such endeavors uh, because it has been so beneficial for students and for faculty for universities for institutions in terms of research in terms of projects in terms of capacity building it had a, a lot of diverse opportunities for both faculty and for students um, so also that uh, UNIMED can uh, take a role in that aspect too. Now, going to the technical part, uh, where we universities and higher education institutions have played a role, um, uh, and we have put in concerted efforts to try to internationalize ourselves uh, to the maximum we can, copying experiences, uh, not only at the curriculum level, but also at the non-curricular uh, level in different aspects, whether we're talking about joint research or whether we're talking about um, having the um, the, uh, the framework for accreditation, or whether we're talking about, you know, the different sorts of uh, uh, pro programs. Um, and in that aspect, I would like to uh, jump probably to the second question where I could uh, mentioned few uh, recommendations, especially where we can see like um, disparities between the North and the South uh, shores of the Mediterranean, different institutions, different uh, international endeavors, uh, even within the same region. So probably um, 
we need to have some sort of more cooperation uh, at the grassroots level. Uh, probably uh, our colleague in Morocco, uh, Professor Bruno, has mentioned that we have to go uh, from uh, up the pyramid down down uh, to the bottom. And I would say probably uh, the international relations at the grassroots level need more investment, which means that uh, probably an idea of uh, having a special forum for uh, international relations officers at the very grassroots, at the very uh, low level, uh, try to liaise between the different countries, the different universities within the same region and between North and South. So th in that case, sharing of experiences and sharing of and sharing of uh, methodologies of how to internationalize because again how 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 much do you want to expand in terms of internationalization are we only talking about um, exchanges or mobilities or are we going beyond to the rankings to the international accreditations to certain programs uh, to uh, opening up uh, the opportunities for postdoctorate for sabbaticals which is not happening a lot really sabbatical uh, opportunities mm -hmm. and postdoc uh, is also as important as mobilities and which could enrich uh, ultimately the scientific research where we can see like a huge gap between the north and the south so there are a lot of opportunities and these opportunities can only be discussed not at the rector's level or not at the big forums level but at the very grassroots levels at the uh, within those administrative staff who work on daily basis uh, in the different international offices and we don't have very much this opportunity or this um uh possibility of sharing thoughts uh, among simply young admin uh, people of how we do things. Probably some of them do not know how merely to how to apply for a project or how to liaise with a with a joint venture on different forums or how to do small things. Um, uh, better ask, better you know, uh, explain to our colleagues um, within the different universities. Uh, so I would probably would like to call upon UNIMED uh, to initiate um, this low level communication or low level forum between international relations officers. Um, and this is how we all grow up. Uh, to internationalize, we need to minimize the gaps that we have between the North and South shores of the Mediterranean. And this cannot only be done at the political, uh, high political level or the rector's level, but we need to go down uh, to the, um, you know, uh, very deep within uh, the universities themselves. Uh, and obviously we're always there to help in how we initiated experiences and how we've embarked on uh, high international uh, steps where we probably considered as developing countries and but where we are now. Um, and if you allow me, I'd like to just cite one example that um, I feel proud that a Najah University in Palestine under occupation with limited resources uh, considered in developing countries, we have uh, managed to score 409 out of 500 best universities and that is the times higher education ranking uh, which is one of the most prestigious rankings in the world but we managed to score to, to get to that school it's just you know um, again it's efforts it's uh, uh, self initiatives and it's overall a will thank you Kerry. and always after your intervention is some some more work for Unimed, <laughs> and I, I will, and I will obviously join the video. We, we are, we have to run for the conclusion. I have my question to our colleague from uh, University of Tripoli, Adele. Uh, and if I may, Adele, as mentioned several times, for previously from your president, but in the, also in the report, the importance of. European cooperation for Libya universities. Uh, at the same time, there is obviously, there are some obstacles on this because uh, the, the perspective of the Libyan situation is not totally clear for, for our European partners in particular. Uh, 
what you suggest is necessary to do to give the right visibility to the Libyan universities. You know that UNIMED did a lot on this, but uh, talking about every single university to try to explain to them uh, what they that, about the Libyan education system. What do you suggest is necessary to do to give to your higher education system the right visibility? I don't want to say something more, but at least the right visibility. This will be very helpful for us. I guess uh, in terms of all the uni Libyan university in the same level, uh, 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 there should be a lot of work need to be done in that aspect. So we have to uh, support these universities throughout the international cooperation offices which is exist in universities but the reality is that they um they need more support i mean because they are or or, or with another word we need to tune their frequencies to become um as high as the uh, our european partners so need more support we need um um facilitate the regulations and put more flexibility on it and we need um to um let the um the uh, decision maker libyan decision makers uh um to be more flexible and more cooperative so yeah i mean um we need uh, such kind of um, uh, reform in the uh, internationalization system, which is exist as uh, Professor Khaled mentioned, which, which is a good thing. I mean, uh, we have these offices which is working um, uh, uh, closely with the uh, decision makers in the university level, but we need more cooperation between the universities themselves and the Ministry of Education or other uh, ministry who involved in the, the, the work, uh, uh, such as the Ministry of Health or things like that. So yeah, um, that's, that's, I guess, the, the crucial point. We need to uh, work with the frequency similar to the one which is uh, our parts working with. Uh, also, we need to expand our cooperation with the uh, uh, Arab regions or Mediterranean regions, which is, I mean, Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Morocco. We need more cooperation with these uh, uh, universities, and um, that will, I mean, build um, concrete base for uh, a good uh, internationalization work, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you know uh, that for the University of Tripoli, but also for all the other Libyan colleagues, uh, Libyan University, that you can surely count on us. And we will support you in all, the, in all, in all this process for, to improve the cooperation with your neighborhood, but also with European, European partners. And we, will have, we, we have very nice plan for, for Libyan education system that we will discuss so uh, we are in a very you know delay in some way but we can't conclude without the conclusions of uh, i kind i have a question for a question for madame ben abedal of union for mediterranean and if i may also a small question very very simple to answer um, as you know, the European Commission is organizing a sort of large conference, uh, which is a sort of large debate on the future of Europe, which is extremely interesting that also new ideas, new challenges are coming and also the participation with this bottom up approach, but also obviously involving the, the, the policymaker and so on. I think that uh, it's now time to reflect in, in the future for, to create a similar conference for the future of Mediterranean. To at least to, to try to answer to the main question, why we are doing all this, why we are cooperating among us, why we are doing, say, asking for more mobility and is not a technical issue, it's a political mandate that we are trying our perspective and obviously from your most important perspective are trying to manage but 
do you think that obviously in a mid-term we could work all together with all the other players related to Mediterranean? We started with the Barcelona process in 1995. Uh, Unimed started in 1991, before the Barcelona process. But I think that's something that would involve students first on this discussion, youth organization and students about the future, because it's their future, is not our future. The future of Mediterranean could be reasonable, and I see that there is something that is asking more, but please, and then if you can go to the conclusion. Uh, and then I will make the, light, the, the last thanks to all the participants. Please. Merci, merci, uh, Professor Scalisi, for this uh, question. And uh, this question that nous pousse à réfléchir ensemble sur le futur de la Méditerranée. Parler d'une réunion sur le futur de l'Europe ne peut pas être sans parler du futur de la Méditerranée. Et je, crois que, euh, et je crois que vous partagez avec moi l'opinion qu'il y a une interdépendance entre le futur du continent européen et le futur de la Méditerranée. Si on a pensé au processus de Barcelone en 1995, après la création de l'Union européenne, qu'il s'est avéré qu'on ne peut pas parler de l'Union européenne sans penser à l'autre rive de la Méditerranée, à la rive sud. Maintenant, parler du futur euh, de la Méditerranée, oui, c'est bien, c'est très important. Et, et bien sûr, on, va associer, on doit associer euh, euh, la jeunesse, et, et même dans le, notre travaux ici à l'EPM, pas seulement dans le, le domaine de l'enseignement supérieur, mais dans tous les domaines, il y a, euh, on a déjà un forum de jeunesse où il y a la participation des jeunes pour parler et pour écouter les voix de la, de la jeunesse. Mais à mon simple avis, moi, je parlerai pas seulement du futur de la Méditerranée, mais la Méditerranée actuellement, ce qu'on vit actuellement en Méditerranée, parce que si au niveau européen, euh, on est passé pour parler à l'avenir de l'Europe, je crois au niveau méditerranéen, on doit parler même maintenant des questions et des, et des problématiques que la Méditerranée et la jeunesse méditerranéenne est en train de, 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 de vivre, pas seulement question de mobilité, mais question également sur laquelle moi, je, 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 c'est-à-dire je, je mets toujours l'accent, c'est la qualité de l'enseignement euh, supérieur, c'est la privatisation de l'enseignement euh, de l'enseignement supérieur entre euh, université privée, université publique. Euh, pourquoi l'étudiant euh, dans une université publique, il n'a pas les mêmes chances d'être embauché comme un étudiant dans une université euh, dans une université privée. Toutes ces questions là qui ont été vraies pour certains, certaines, euh, certaines universités ont été posées euh, lors de la pandémie, mais ces questions sont, euh, actu existent même euh, avant, avant euh, la pandémie. C'est-à-dire, pour moi, euh, je crois que l'urgence, ce n'est pas parler seulement du futur de la Méditerranée, mais parler de la situation actuelle de, euh, euh, en Méditerranée et les problématiques que la jeunesse méditerranéenne, pas seulement dans les pays du Sud, mais également dans les pays du Nord, qui sont en train de euh, c'est-à-dire euh, euh, vivre ces, ces problématiques, ces problématiques là. Euh, associer la jeunesse, c'est bien, mais également euh, il faut préconiser une participation de la société civile avec les gouvernements. Parce qu'après, on va avoir des déclarations émanant de la société civile, mais qui vont rester des déclarations qui ne vont pas avoir après, ils ne vont pas euh, être concré euh, concrétisées. C'est pour ça que la participation de la société civile, elle est importante, mais elle doit être également avec la participation des représentants des gouvernements pour qu'on ait des, des engagements. Et je crois que ça, c'est notre rôle en tant qu'organisation intergouvernementale avec 42 pays qu'on essaye d'associer la société civile mais également les, les gouvernements la tâche notre tâche n'est pas facile mais je crois que grâce à vous et surtout les universitaires qui sont là pour éclairer les décideurs politiques et pour éclairer leurs étudiants ça nous facilitera également notre tâche 
et euh, ça nous permettra de discuter la, 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 la situation actuelle et après on discutera le futur, euh, le futur de, de, de notre Méditerranée et euh, comme j'ai commencé euh, on ne peut pas parler du futur euh, de l'Europe sans parler du futur de la, euh, de la Méditerranée parce que je me permets de dire, parce qu'il y a certains qui disent qu'il y en a des problèmes que l'Europe rencontre qui viennent de notre rive de la Méditerranée. Alors, c'est bien de discuter les deux. <rire> Il y a une interdépendance, interdépendance de, 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 de liens entre l'Europe et, et la Méditerranée. Je ne sais pas, est-ce que peut-être <rire> vous m'avez poussé à parler un peu trop, hein, <rire> professeur, et on va, mais, mais euh, c'est la, la réalité, c'est la réalité. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I think that joint forces, this will be possible, because uh, to talk to government is not our job. We are not able to manage this task. Um, and I think that organizations that are on the table, plus many others, obviously, are able to, to in a way, to, to debate about this opportunity. I agree with you that there is the future, there is also the current situation, and that is uh, important to try to have a look at the current situation to imagine that we have a future. Uh, I think that we have to combine these two elements, but there is room obviously for discussion. I think that we have to conclude because we are very late in, um, in, with our program. I just to mention that some of the issues discussed today were in some way addressed to during the webinars that we had with the European Commission G Education and Culture but also with the European Commission for DG Research and Innovation. They, they are trying to, with the next program to, to try to answer to some of the priorities that we have mentioned through projects, of course. And I think that is important that thanks to our discussion, we have contents, ideas, and obviously work already done to try to answer to the calls of European Commission. I think that I invite all of our participants to review the webinars that we already did in this sense. Tomorrow and uh, Thursday, we have the last two webinars. Tomorrow with the European Training Foundation discussing about micro-credential. And on the 30th of September, we will have a debate with uh, the Director General uh, for the Neighborhood Policy, the DG NIAR. Uh, we will debate about, in practical terms, the, the, the new agenda for Southern Mediterranean countries, with some example from the GNIA about potential activity that is possible to, to manage. We started the first day with the discussion with the External Action Service, the European External Action Service, that gave us an idea about the policy framework of the new agenda for Southern Mediterranean countries, and we will conclude with the practical elements, with practical elements with DG, uh, the GINIA. I invite all of, all of you to participate at these two webinars. And now we go to uh, thanks, to thanks obviously all our speakers and all our participants for your, first of all, for your patience with this uh, uh, webinar and also with it today. Uh, a special thanks, of course, to the Union for Mediterranean for the continuous support to our activity uh, and also for, for, for the opportunity to work very close with you uh, for the report. I would like also to thank all my UNIMED colleagues present here for the webinar, Marco and Laurence and Martina, but also all the other colleagues that uh, worked with us for the union uh, for, for the report. Uh, I can't mention of them, but it was a very large, as presented by Marco, a very large group of people that worked with us. And last but not least, a uh, very special thanks to our interpreter, Claudia Marchetti, for I know that we were in a delay and probably you are a little tired, but thank you very much. Grazie mille for your work. Thank you very much to all of you, and I hope to see you in the coming webinars, but I hope, more important, to see you in presence somewhere 
or in Barcelona or in Brussels or in Palestine or in Egypt, in Morocco or in Rome, we wait you, but surely soon in Tripoli, as I said to Adele and to the press. See you soon. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon and nice evening. Bye. Bye. Merci à vous.